a time to question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. Speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Night Fright, your voice in the dark for Paranormal and Conspiracy Radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. Welcome, welcome, welcome one and all. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome to Night Fright. Well, I got to tell you folks, I'm pumped tonight. Nick Redfern's joining us tonight, and I'm really excited. We're going to be looking at his new book called Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind. And some of the topics we're going to be discussing tonight are things like the UFO-related death of the very first U.S. Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, the mysterious disappearance of military pilots and their UFO links, The theory, are you ready for this one? This is one that's been kicking around a while, but this is really interesting. And as you know, I'm a big JFK guy, so I want to get Nick's take on this. And that's the theory that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated to prevent him from revealing the truth about UFOs. So get the coffee going, get the tea going, get a beverage of your choice going. Folks, next two hours, Nick Redfern's with us. Kick back. This is your time to relax, folks. This is, you know, you worked all day long. Relax. We're going to take you on a terrific ride. Just let me read this little brief bio about Nick. Nick works full time as an author, lecturer, and journalist. He writes about a wide range of unsolved mysteries, including Bigfoot, UFOs, the Loch Ness Monsters, alien encounters, and government conspiracies. Um, You've seen Nick for sure, folks. He writes for many publications, including UFO Magazine, Fate, and 14 Times. Nick's appeared on numerous television shows, including Fox News, the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, Monster Quest, and UFO Hunters, VH1's Legend Hunters, National Geographic's The Truth About UFOs, and Paranormal BBC's Out of the World, MSNBC's Countdown, and Sci-Fi Channel's Proof Positive. I want to welcome Nick to Night Fright for the very first time, and most definitely not the last time. Hi, Nick. How are you? Hi, Brent. I'm doing good, thanks. How's it going? It's going very, very well. You're in Dallas, are you? Yeah, well, I live just outside Dallas in uh, Arlington, which is about halfway between Dallas and Fort Worth. Okay, okay. Um, I was down in Dallas last year for the uh, JFK Memorial. And, uh, oh, yeah. I had a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, cool. Let's jump in right away, shall we? Now, this forest doll thing caught my eye. And, you know, there's been rumors flying around for eons, it seems, that perhaps Mr. Forrestal was succumbed to some... Uh, malevolent, <laughs> to put it mildly, malevolent guys from the, from the uh, national security in the United States. Now, just to set it up, folks, uh, James Forrestal, Forrestal was the first Secretary of Defense. Uh, he was put in that position by none other than President Howie, Howard Truman, um, Harry Truman. I'll get it together yet, folks. I haven't had my coffee. Uh, Harry Truman. And um, so we're looking at, you know, uh, the the late 40s, uh, essentially. How did you come upon this information that he may have been, uh, for lack of a better term, executed because of his knowledge? Well, actually, you know, the theory has been around since the day he died. Um, Forrestal died on May the 22nd, 1949, and his brother, from that very day, loudly and sort of vocally said that he felt... um, that his brother had been killed. So it's not, you know, in other words, it's not a new theory. Um, It's sort of very much like the, um, like the Kennedy assassination Mm. in the sense that um, it's like a long-standing death with a lot of controversial aspects to it. And and those controversial aspects, if you read sort of the local and um, contemporary newspapers of the day, um, you know, they were talking about it practically immediately because of his brother's stance on it. But um, you're right that um, Forrester was the first 
Secretary of Defence, and uh, prior to that he was the Secretary of the Navy during the Second World War. So he was someone who held a lot of sort of prestigious positions and had a lot of responsibility. But he was also a guy who didn't handle stress that well and um, had sort of a very fraught relationship with his wife, who was an alcoholic. And um, over time, things began to take their toll on him. Now, the big question is, why did they take their toll on him? People say, well, you know, he had a responsible job as Secretary of Defence, which is true. But bear in mind that this was in peacetime when he was elected. He'd actually served as Secretary of Navy throughout one of the most turbulent times ever, the Second World War. So, in other words, if he could cope with the position of Secretary of Navy throughout the Second World War, when, you know, there were times when it looked like Hitler could actually have won, why is it that he could cope with that? But he had real problems and spiralled into this complete breakdown by 49. <clears throat> now, a number of people have come forward, whistleblowers and elderly people and so on, retired military to say that one of the reasons at least why or that contributed if not was the, the entire uh, angle behind his collapse was the UFO issue now bear in mind somebody like the Secretary of Defense whose job it is you know to oversee the defense of the country when the whole UFO thing kicked off in the summer of 47 and then Forrester was briefed uh, excuse me but was elected in September 47 the chances are he would have received probably a highly classified briefing on what was known and what had been discovered in that two months since Kenneth Arnold's sighting through to when he was elected. And so the big question is, what was he told? You know, he may have been told about Roswell and things like this, that, you know, we've seen these craft flying around, we don't know who they belong to, but we've got the remains of one and some bodies and they're clearly not Russian or or whatever, you know, it looks like somebody from somewhere else is visiting us. That may have been the extent of it. But other people suggest that um, it may have got far darker with briefings on things like abductions and missing pilots and people found dead and all sorts of weird stuff. And this may have had a bearing on Forrestal's psychological state. Now, what all we know for sure is that he pretty much plunged into like a total psychological collapse in early 49. Mm -hmm. And in March, he was taken to the Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland ostensibly for his own good and he was placed in um, a room on the 16th floor and he had a permanent military presence watching over him for the entire time <clears throat> now after sort of about five or six weeks in the hospital he actually got a lot better um you know he was eating well he was shaving showering looking after himself you know he wasn't like somebody sitting in the corner of the room crying or whatever um and the the military guy who spent most of the time with him Forrestal actually offered him a job as his as Forrestal's personal chauffeur when he got out of the hospital um now that unfortunately didn't happen what did happen was that his brother um who suspected there was actually something suspicious as to why he was being held there his brother felt that it was going on too long and then every time he found the hospital there'd be another reason and another reason why they wouldn't let him out now, within ufology, it's been suggested that the reason he wasn't being allowed out of the hospital was because there were fears that Forrester supposedly said to people that he was going to blow the whistle and tell everybody about the UFO presence. And by everybody, he meant the world, the media, everyone. And certain powerful players were of the view that, well, there's just no way that's going to happen. We're just not going to let it happen. So in the short term, the idea was to keep Forrester under lock and key for as long as possible. But what happened was on the morning of the 21st of May, 1949, his brother phoned the hospital and said, look, whether you like it or not, I'm coming to the hospital tomorrow morning, May the 22nd, and I'm checking him out, and, you know, and try and stop me. Hmm. And um, so, in other words, if somebody did want to get rid of Forrestal and his brother phoned on the 21st, said, I'm coming in on the 22nd, you could really only get rid of him on the night of the 21st or in the early hours of the 22nd. And that's exactly what happened. Um, depending on whose version of events you accept, Forrester either jumped or was pushed um, or fell from a 16th floor window and slammed into a third floor canopy that stuck out from the main building, you know, before 13 floors were building. 
oh, to a, you know, a solid roof, you're just not going to live. And, of course, he didn't. Now, um, as I said, his brother, from that very day on, believed and actually said quite openly and vocally that, that Forrester had been murdered. Um, now, the, the circumstances around the death are very suspicious as well, because the, for the, pretty much all the time he was in there, Forrestal had a military um, operative sitting with him, you know, just overseeing him through day and night, and they would do shifts. Well, it turns out that just before Forrestal uh, plunged to his death, the military guard who was with him was called out of the room, the circumstances that even today nobody is really 100% sure of. And it was while Forrestal was left alone that he suddenly wound up dead. Now, on top of that, we have questions about the nature of the death. For example, the official story is that he took the cord from around his dressing gown, put one end around his neck, double-tied it in a knot, and then put the other end uh, around the radiator in the room, again, in a double knot to secure it, then climbed out the window, then lowered himself down the other side. But if you think of it, you know, how long would a, a cord from a dressing gown have to beat to allow you to tie one end around your neck and double knot it, the other end around the radiator, then actually climb out of the window, then lower yourself down. You know, we're not, you'd be talking sort of a, a cord six or seven feet long to allow you to do all that. It seems absurd. So, a lot of questions and um, and then he, he plummeted to his death. That was the end of Forrestal and um, so, he, you know, it is very much like an early equivalent of like the Kennedy assassination with a lot of different theories as to why he was killed, um, who was it, you know, on location at the time and all sorts of different things. But it's definitely a very strange death. Now we also know, Nick, that um, he had a falling out with Truman and had mm -hmm. to resign. Truman asked him to resign. Was that because of the mental illness or do you think just speculation is fine? Do well, you think there could have been something more there? I think it there? probably was due to the mental illness because that probably okay. just made regular relations in terms of, you know, working in government almost impossible to do. You know, he, he did literally go into the state where, you know, he could barely function, he could barely eat. Okay. You know, he just didn't look after himself. Um, you know, like a total nervous breakdown. And um, I said that although, he, yes, he was prone to, you know, depression and had a sort of unstable relationship with his wife, um, that, you know, that didn't stop him, as I said, you know, working fully and to the best of his ability in the Second World War, when we were at war, fighting for survival and freedom, you know, and then that in, this is post-war, you know, when he, when he was, um, when this happened to him, you would imagine it was going to be the other way around, you know, that if he was going to have a collapse, it was when, you know, the, the Germans are threatening the world, not when we're just coming to a period of peace. So, uh that in itself is an odd one, too. There is a huge question mark there. Folks, www.nightfrightshow.com, www.nightfrightshow.com. There you will find a link to our guest tonight, Nick Redfern's new book, and that book is called, As I Find My Notes, <laughs> <laughs> Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind. And uh, it's a great book, folks. Uh, easy way to get it, of course. Just click on the book link, cover, uh, the cover of the, um, the book, and that'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home. Uh, we're going to put a bunch of books up. Uh, Nick, of course, has uh, tons of books out there. Another one is Contact D's, A History of Alien-Human Interaction. We're going to be looking at the Kennedy assassination tonight, too, folks. Um, there's some ominous undertones with that, and perhaps he may have been killed because he may have been about to reveal something very special about UFOs. Uh, we're speaking with Nick Redfern, of course. Fans of uh, the History Channel will recognize that name from Alien, Ancient Aliens, and um, he just does great work in general. Let's talk about some more of these uh, interesting cases. Now, do you feel that in some of the cases, the aliens themselves may have done away with these people, or do you feel in some cases it could have been somebody from the darker side of intelligence? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of split the, the book in, not into different two sections, but the chapters kind of jump around where one clearly seems to be a case of murder, 
and in others it's where pilots have vanished or aircraft have exploded and crashed in relation to UFO events. But, you know, when you sort of talk about the darker side of intelligence and things like this, one of the things I point out in the book is that, you know, a lot of the cases in the book occur in the U.S. But personally, I, I truly don't believe that the U.S. government at all is behind any of these deaths. What I personally think is that the deaths and the overall sort of highly classified UFO program, I think probably many years ago, was sort of taken out of the hands of government and mm. transferred over to what we might call like a shadow agency or a shadow government, one that, you know, 99.9% .9 of government know nothing about. They have no access to it. They have no knowledge of it. They don't have a key to get into it. And I think that's why, you know, when people sort of use the Freedom of Information Act and go knocking on the doors of, mm -hmm. say, the CIA or the Air Force of files on Roswell, you know, they come back and say, we've got nothing. Now, some UFO researchers take the view that these agencies are just flat out lying. I actually don't. I, I think most of these agencies and the people who work for them today are as baffled as we are as to why they can't find the files on Roswell. And I think it is because, as I said, you know, if you imagine... Imagine something like a government agency, but that actually operates outside of the regular government that gets its funding through sort of black budget means mm -hmm. that, you know, you most people never have any access to. Now, you imagine that kind of combined with something like an ancient or a modern day equivalent of some ancient order like the Illuminati, where, you know, it's linked with powerful figures and ancient money and strands and tentacles spreading all around the world I, th I really think that is the people who are responsible for these mysterious deaths the people who are overseeing the ufo issue and as i said i think it's probably all been farmed out to this agency whatever it might be from government probably 30 40 years ago maybe somewhere around that time you know there's, there's ev good evidence that truman and eisenhower for example knew all about the ufo problem but by the kennedy era it seems, you know, the president actually had to ask what's going on, who's got the information, and that's kind of the thing that leads me to believe the government isn't the guilty party at all, but, but somebody is, but it's like a, like I said, a, an extra government almost, you know, a, a government within a government that nobody really knows about. And folks, you know, there's, I've got in front of me something very ominous on November 12th, 1963, and this is marked Top Secret Memorandum, November 12th, that's 10 days, only 10 days before JFK was assassinated in Dallas in Dealey Plaza. He was assassinated November 22nd. So this is November 12th, 1963, and it's addressed to the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. The subject is classification review of all UFO intelligence files affecting national security. And it goes on to say, as I had discovered, this is JFK writing this, as I had discussed with you previously, I have instituted, uh, and then it's redacted, it's blacked out, and have instructed James Webb to develop a program with the Soviet Union in joint space and lunar exploration. That could be a reason right there why he was killed too. It would be very helpful if you would have the threat analysis reviewed with the purpose of identification of bona fide uh, of those opposed to classified CIA and USAF, United States Air Force sources. And then it says, when this data has been sorted out, I would like you to arrange a program of data sharing with NASA where quote unquote unknowns are a factor. This will help NASA revision directors in their defensive responsibilities. I would like an interim report on the data review no later than February 1st, 1964, and it's on John F. Kennedy. Now, let me just say that again, the subject classification review of all UFO intelligent files affecting national security. That's ominous. That's 10 days before his assassination. What do you think, Nick? 
Well, I mean, that document's interesting. It actually wasn't one that surfaced through the Freedom of Information Act. It was one that was ostensibly leaked in the 1990s to a man named Timothy Cooper, as now out of the UFO subject. And so, of course, you know, when it comes to, <coughs> excuse me, leak, so-called leak documents, mm -hmm. it sort of raised a lot of controversial issues as to, you know, the extent to which they're real or not. But one of the things I would say is that it is absolutely 100% true that, uh, and this is verifiable through the Freedom of Information Act, that actually in that very same time frame, like 10 days before he was shot, Kennedy actually approached James Webb of NASA and said, look, I want to open up, ostensibly open up parts of the space program and space exploration to the Soviet Union. But that is absolutely 100% true. Mm -hmm. What's also true is, is that document, sort of what it basically deals with were concerns and fears that, say, for example, a large squadron of UFOs flew over the Soviet Union. The fear was the Soviets might misinterpret the UFOs as a sneak attack by the West and it would sort of launch into a full-scale nuclear war, actually provoked by mistaken identity of UFOs. So the, the story is that Kennedy wanted to share with the Russians um, information on certain aspects of the US, like the U-2 spy plane program, so that the Russians wouldn't misinterpret something, and we wouldn't misinterpret something of theirs. Um, and that was actually something also addressed by the CIA's Robertson panel in the early 50s, the idea that um, nuclear war might break out when, you know, opposing sides were tracking weird things on their radar scopes and misinterpreted them as, you know, Soviet bombers or American bombers. So that, that is one of the theories as to why he wanted to open it up to the Soviets, not so much just to share it with them for the sake of it, but because not sharing information might inadvertently, you know, lead to nuclear war. Mm -hmm. That's pretty frightening stuff. Folks, we're speaking with Nick Redfern. His book is called Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind, and it chronicles many, many cases of where people in and around uh, government, uh, pilots, for example, uh, Secretary of Defense, we just mentioned, Forrestal, maybe even JFK himself, have been assassinated, have disappeared, have been killed, perhaps because of their knowledge of UFOs. What, what did you find out from the pilots? Uh, you know, I, where, where I am in is a place called Kingston, Ontario. And, and here, folks, it's uh, Canada's version of West Point. This is where we train all our guys to be commanders. And Kingston, folks, just for a geographical location, is an hour and a half north of Syracuse. It's right where Lake Ontario meets the St. Lawrence River. Um, there's a lot of pilots here. There's a lot of commanders here. And they'll come to me off record and tell me stories about UFO sightings and stuff like that. But they will never go on record, of course, because it could be detrimental to their careers. Did you find much the same thing in your research? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's um, a lot of cases involving pilots, um, you know, where pilots have either vanished or they've been seen in close proximity to UFOs and the UFOs have suddenly crashed. I mean, excuse me, the aircraft has suddenly crashed. There other cases, very interesting ones, of just total disappearances. Um, that's the, the weirdest ones I talk about in the book. All occurred in November 1953. And it began, the first one occurred on November the 10th, 1953. But we sort of have to go back about 18 months. And um, this story all revolves around two guys, one named Carl Hunrath and the other one named Wilbur Wilkinson. They both lived originally in Wisconsin both got fascinated by the UFO subject in the late 40s and began to do a lot of research. And um, Hunrath was sort of like a, a good sort of technical wizard type of guy, you know, in, in, uh, built sort of weird devices and all sorts of strange contraptions. And um, he decided in early 52 to move to Los Angeles because he felt that's where most of the UFO action and the players in the subject were based, and which it actually was like that. Yeah. Um, you know, he had a lot of the early contactees living in LA and surrounding areas, and a lot of the early researchers too. So Hunrath moved out there. A couple of weeks later, uh, Wilkinson and his wife and children also moved out there. Now, Hunrath and Wilkinson sort of quickly hooked up with a lot of the 
the big names in ufology at that time, like some of the early contactees, such as George Adamski and um, George Hunt Williamson. And they particularly sort of struck a, a friendship up with George Hunt Williamson, who actually lived out in Arizona in Flagstaff. But um, they spent a great deal of time um, at Wilkinson's place um, trying to contact aliens, <clears throat> excuse me, not by sort of literal metal flying saucers landing in the desert, but by sort of like mind-to-mind -mind contact. They would sort of get their minds into altered states and, you know, try and project the, the message out there to, to come down. Now, we're not really sure under the circumstances how it happened, but both men suddenly put out like a, a press release, I guess, to the UFO community at the time that they had received a positive contact from these aliens who were very much like us. So sort of the classic 1950s space brother type aliens with sort of long blonde hair and very human looking. Mm -hmm. And they said that they'd been told that the aliens wanted to meet with them on a specific um, stretch of California mountain range in early November 1953. Now, Regardless whether or not that's true or not, what did happen is that on November the 10th, 1953, Hunrath and Wilkinson took to the skies from a small airport just outside LA in a small plane. And Hunrath was a was a pilot, um, so you know he, he he flew the plane. And they got permission to take off. You know they were in touch with the ground uh, control tower, etc. And then suddenly there was nothing. There was just total silence. And they vanished off the radar. Nobody had any idea what had happened to them at all. The only thing we know for sure is that um, in literally, you know, within hours, um, emergency teams were sent out to see if they could find them. Um, sort of local, uh, you had everything from like the fire department, the police, to local private aircraft and emergency aircraft, scanning around the area, flying around the nearby hills and mountains, and this search actually went on for like the best part of four five days on and off um and, he, and even in the sort of the weeks and months after that people were trekking around the area nothing was ever found no aircraft no parts of the aircraft in the immediate aftermath of the takeoff there was sort of no telltale smokestacks or you know mm -hmm. parts of the, the forest on fire which might have been the case had an aircraft crashed um no stories of them heading uh, or proof of them heading, you know, across the border to Mexico. All that theory had been sort of mooted, you know, is it possible that it was a cover story? But they were never seen again. They literally, for all intents and purposes, sort of vanished off the place of the earth. And, you know, some people have speculated that that may have been exactly what happened, given the fact that they claimed that they were going to sort of meet these extraterrestrials. Now, what makes this all the more weird is that Honrath, Carl Honrath, one of the two guys who vanished, I mentioned that he was sort of a technical wizard. Well, he claimed, under very bizarre circumstances, that the aliens had provided him with sort of a, an aircraft-destroying technology that could bring down any kind of aircraft on the planet. And it turns out that Honrath, who didn't really get on well with George Adamski, one of the early contactees, had loudly claimed that he was going to use this device to bring down U.S. military aircraft just because he could. <laughs> and this actually resulted in Hunrath becoming the subject of an official FBI file. They opened a file pretty much immediately, as you can probably imagine they would. But um, what happened was that um, if you consider the circumstances, you have Hunrath talking about um, meeting with aliens and having this aircraft destroying technology. Well, it turns out that just two weeks after Honrath and Wilkinson disappeared, there were the crashes of two aircraft in Wisconsin, just barely a stone's throw from where Honrath lived originally in Wisconsin. And one of these uh, the events in question occurred on November the 23rd, 1953. And on the morning, a Northrop F-89 Scorpion aircraft, which flew out of a place called Trow Field in Madison, Wisconsin, plunged to the skies into like a like a, a swampy lake type area. Both pilots were killed or both crew members were killed and people in the area reported seeing a UFO in and around that exact same vicinity just like 20, 30 minutes before. Well, if that wasn't strange enough, 
on the very same day, but later that night, another aircraft, another F-89 Scorpion, um, took off from Trow Field, and rather than actually crash, that one vanished. And um, really? it actually vanished uh, while it was flying over Lake Superior. Um, the pilot was vectored onto an unknown target over the lake. As he closed in on it and got closer and closer and closer, the two targets merged into one and then vanished. Oh and goodness. just like with Humbrath and Wilkinson, um, there was no wreckage found on the, fl um, you know, floating on the lake. They sent divers down as far as they could go. They couldn't see anything. Uh, emergency services were out there quickly. Nothing at all. So they kind of vanished just like Hunrath and Wilkinson. But if you think about it, you know, you have this really strange issue how Hunrath said, he, you know, the aliens have given them this aircraft destroying technology. Then you have two aircraft, both the UFO associations, military aircraft, crashing or vanishing, only a stone's throw from where Hunrat lived. So this has given rise to another theory that maybe he staged the disappearance and actually targeted US planes with alien technology to see if it worked, but did so, you know, he made sure that people thought he was dead so he wouldn't sort of, you know, get the rap for it. So there's, there's clearly, you know, major parts of this story that still to be uncovered, but it's a very, very weird one. No kidding. Um that's amazing. I was going to ask you about the missing Malaysia airplane. They've never found it. Is there any rumors or stories surrounding that disappearance that are similar to these parallels? Um, well, I mean, I've heard a few speculations, but I've not really seen anybody come up, okay. you know, with anything conclusive as to what happened. I mean, I kind of take a more down-to-earth approach. Not not down-to-earth in the sense that I don't think something suspicious or weird happened. I think it did. But I think the problem is, you know, everybody's saying, well, you know, surely we can find a plane like that today with today's technology. One of the problems is that, you know, if you if you look at the sheer sky, scale and size of the planet and how much ocean there is and how deep it is, um, you only need to be like five or 600 miles off or a 1,000 miles off you're looking in totally the wrong area, and the thing's plummeted, you know, thousands and thousands of feet down, maybe shattered into who knows how many pieces, then you could just be looking in the wrong place. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there are some weird aspects to it, like the, a lot of investigations have been done into what the pilot was doing beforehand. You know, he was, for example, he'd actually been studying ways to land an aircraft on an island. You know, why on earth would you do that? So the fact that the pilot was looking into things like this, I think, I think something weird happened, but I think it, we, it, it had nothing to do with something like UFOs. I think it was more, you know, like a national security issue or something mm -hmm. was going on there. But I don't think it had anything to do with sort of like portals or dimensional jumps or, gotcha. you know, UFOs zapping it. I think it was, it was a down-to-earth conspiracy of some sort. Understood. Folks, the insightful Nick Redfern is our guest tonight, and we're talking about UFOs, of course. He's got a new book out. It's called Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind. Easy way to get that book and all his other books, just go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website, click on tonight's guest book covers, plural, and that'll take you right to a spot where you can order them from the comfort of your own home. Also there will be uh, several links to Nick's websites. So do check those out because I was on his website so, oh, in preparation for tonight's show. And there's tons of stuff there that uh, is going to be of interest for you. Things that we just won't have time to go into uh, the depths and the details tonight. But certainly, I would recommend that as a source of information as well. Uh, Nick Redfern, of course, we're talking about the new book, Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind. Now, you know, the other thing that's in the news right now, and this frightens the bejesus out of me, is the Ebola virus. Now, I know you've done great research on alien viruses. Is there any connection, Nick, in your opinion? Um, well, I'm not sure there's a connection you know, with Ebola, but I mean, the whole sort of theoretical idea of alien viruses is one that um, <coughs> excuse me, government agencies take very seriously. For example, um, I, I do a lot of, uh, although I write my own books, I also do a lot of sort of proofreading, editing, and ghostwriting, offer ghostwriting services for other authors. 
And on this matter, I worked um, closely um, with a fellow researcher and friend of mine, Dr. Bob Wood, um, who's been fascinated for years by this whole idea of alien viruses. So I did a lot of work for Bob on, on his manuscript, which is now available as a book called Alien Viruses, and uh, strangely enough. <laughs> and um, the book itself is a study of you know, the various stories that have been spread throughout the UFO field for years that the UFO phenomenon um, and alien viruses are, you know, not just valid issues, but actually, you know, interconnected. For example, there are a number of stories where reported at UFO crash sites, um, the recovery teams have supposedly fallen victim to uh, lethal alien viruses caused by when the, the alien bodies have sort of been exposed to the atmosphere and pummeled and torn open, that it's let loose, you know, a microbe that is deadly to the human race. But the theory is, and this is kind of good news for us, is that, you know, the, the they, viruses have different, you know, various viruses have different lifespans, um, so to speak. And so in that sense, the idea is that these alien viruses were sort of localized and, and didn't last, you know, and if you're lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the right time, you could well fall victim to it. But, you know, over a very short period, the, the virus would die and, you know, you wouldn't be affected by it. Um, kind of like, say, for example, you know, you get chicken pox. If you're around somebody when the virus is still active, you're going to get it. If, if it's after it become, you know, it's, it's lived its lifespan and the person's just got the the spots or whatever, you're not going to get it. And that's kind of that situation. And uh, certainly in a fictional scenario, that's sort of most um, graphically portrayed in Michael Crichton's book, Michael Crichton who wrote Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. in his book and movie spin-off, The Andromeda Spray, uh, Strain, that book. which and deals mm -hmm. with the crash of um, a US spacecraft returning um, from Venus, I think it is, to, uh, to the Earth. And unknowingly brings these alien microbes that start killing people and then the race is then on to sort of save the human race. But I mean it is a fact that um, NASA and every world government that um, has sort of ventured in outer space has addressed at various times this whole issue of being careful not to bring back lethal microbes. For example, NASA has um, a position which has the, I mean, it's a really cool name that the other person has, but they call her, uh, I forget what the woman's name is now, but she's the planetary protection officer. That's what her official title is. And it's her job to um, essentially, you know, um, to forecast and ensure that something like the best protection possible is put into place so we don't fall victim to alien viruses. But, uh, you know, everybody thinks if hostile aliens are going to attack it's going to be like an Independence Day or War of the Worlds type scenario. It could well be we could just be wiped out by an alien virus because there are a lot of terrestrial viruses that we have a great deal of trouble combating. I mean, you mentioned Ebola. You know, you get Ebola, you're in major, major trouble. Or SARS. Um, or rabies. You know, when rabies kicks in, I mean, that's probably like the closest thing to a real-life zombie virus. When, some, when the rabies virus gets a hold of a person, you know, they have to be strapped down. They literally are, they're rabid. Um, and you also got, like, like HIV, you know, people who are, who are HIV positive today with, you know, a big enough cocktail of whatever drugs they need, they can pretty much live normal length lifespans now. But, you know, they stop taking the drugs and, the, you know, the virus hits them again um, and they're all terrestrial viruses that we have problems dealing with you imagine if we're faced with something that's totally extra extraterrestrial our immunity system would have no way to combat that at all now granted a lot of it is theoretical but you know it is something i think we need to potentially prepare for completely agree with you 100 percent. and i was unaware that nasa had somebody of such a stature working for them. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool title, a planetary protection officer. But, yeah, um, but NASA, fiction, when the, but even when the necessary. astronauts went to the moon, mm -hmm. when they came back, I mean, this wasn't a secret. You know, they had to go through a decontamination process just to make sure, you know, they didn't bring anything back. And, you know, the, I forget how long it was, but, you know, the entire equipment, the clothing, mm -hmm. and even the astronauts, you know, were subject to major decontamination before they could 
you know, made their families and friends and colleagues or whatever. But did they really come back? No, I'm kidding. Folks, we're speaking with Nick Redford tonight. You know, Nick, um, Canada is known for a lot of its agriculture right across the uh, the country. We have the wide open uh, plains, etc. Now, almost on a daily basis, uh, a little while ago, we were getting reports of cattle mutilations. Unexplainable, of course. In your research for your book, Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind, did you come across any people that had gone through similar mm. mutilations? Yeah, well, I actually have an entire chapter in the book on human mutilations. And, um, you know, this is a very weird and dark and disturbing aspect of the UFO phenomenon. Mm. You know, I don't say the entire phenomenon is negative, because I don't think it is. But there are some negative, disturbing aspects to it. And certainly this is one of them. Now, for people who may wonder what... I mean by human mutilations or cattle mutilations for people who haven't heard of it. Um, cattle mutilations began largely in the 60s and certainly reached their peak in sort of the mid late 70s in terms of events and, and coverage. Um, essentially, it involves cases where ranchers have reported animals and very often cattle um, found dead with organs removed. Um, with what doesn't look like random attacks from, you know, wild cats or mountain lions or grizzly bears if it's near a forest, but it looks like they've been sort of systematically and carefully dissected, for want of a better term, in terms of organ removal, portions of the skin, the body, the sexual organs, the tongue, the lips, the eyes, the skin. And in some cases, it looks like high heat devices are being used as well. This has given rise to theories about laser weaponry and things like that. So that's basically the scenario with cattle mutilations. And you have a lot of different theories, everything from um, sort of occultists that you do animal sacrifice. You have obviously the UFO angle, the theory that sort of biological weapons are being tested. And then you have a, the very disturbing theory that somebody is monitoring the cattle herd for emerging viruses that could jump from species to species, kind of like a worst case scenario of mad cow disease. So, and I, I sometimes wonder if there may not just be one answer, but regardless of what's going on, we do get reports of um, human mutilations very similar to animal mutilations. Now, although some people might roll their eyes, one of the things I point out is that there actually is evidence of official interest in human mutilations. For example, I mentioned earlier I used the Freedom of Information Act a lot, mm -hmm. and I actually got through the FBI, through the Freedom of Information Act, a document which took from the mid-1970s, which was um, brought to the attention of the director of the FBI, in which a field office, a special agent at a field office, had specifically warned that um, they would uncover stories to the effect that the cattle mutilations were just a forerunner for human mutilations. And that's actually all spelled out in the document. So clearly somebody was watching, you know, the rumors of the human mutilations and reporting back right to the top level of the FBI. Um, but perhaps the most grisly story I talk about in the book reportedly occurred at the height of the, Cam uh, the Vietnam War in Cambodia in 1972. This story came from Leonard Stringfield, who was a long-time UFO researcher, but before that, an intelligence officer with the US Air Force. And um, he went on the record in 1991 as stating that he'd spoken with a high-ranking military source who he trusted implicitly who told Stringfield about an event that occurred, as said, in Cambodia in 72, where a U.S. military team, looking actually for a North Vietnamese military team, stumbled upon like a large globe-shaped UFO in a clearing in the jungles, which was supported by like a tripod-style set of um, landing gear. And the, they stumbled upon these... They kind of looked like the so-called grey aliens, but much taller, like five to six feet tall, um, loading dead, dead human bodies and body parts into these large bins and then sealing them and loading them aboard the craft. And the story was that for all their training, even they were sort of frozen to the spot for a few seconds, which allowed for the like a, a brief firefight to occur and reportedly both sides backed away and the, the troops sort of pulled back into the forest 
and the aliens you know, jumped aboard their craft and the craft took to the skies. Now, you know, it is a very controversial story. It kind of mm-hmm. sounds like something straight out of the Predator movie, almost, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. But um, but Stringfield stood by the story. He said, look, I'm not going to name the guy, but he said, you know, I know who he is. I, I can tell you every rank that he held and where he worked and the positions he held in the Vietnam War. And if he said it happened, Stringfield said he believed him. And, um, you know, he came across as, as very credible in terms of not just telling the story, but, you know, backing up who his source was and, and, and supporting him as well. Nick, has there been a history... Uh, where there's conflict around the world that UFO sightings increase? Is there anything to that at all? Um, that's a good question, actually. Um, I'm not aware of anything, but I would, I would only say that because I'm not aware that a study's being done, you know. Okay. Um, but now that, that would actually be a good area for somebody to look into. Um, because we know, I, you I know, the whole Roswell thing is, is basically... Many, you know, like Stan's been on the show, Stan Friedman, and yeah. he believes, as I do, uh, it could be associated with the nuclear weapon test, the nuclear weapon, the atomic bomb yeah. testing. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of the 1962 missile crisis as well, when we were that close. I don't know. Um, I'd be very curious to find out. No, that, that's actually interesting. I mean, there are, so, I'd say, when you talk about patterns, though, there are actually some weird and interesting patterns. Uh, I'll give you a classic sure. example. Thank you. Back in, this is nothing to do with, um, with with murder as such, but it is to do with the whole angle of, of viruses. Um, again, through the Freedom Information Act, I got a large file which originated with the US Air Force Office of Special Investigations in 1949, where they opened a file on a doctor who had been doing research, and he found that where there were UFO waves from 47 to 49, there suddenly then occurred, like in the weeks afterwards, uh, sudden outbreaks of polio. Now, no one could really understand this, and although the the Air Force was sceptical, the patterns actually were there. And this ran from 47 to 49. The doctor actually believed that the, the intelligences behind the UFO phenomenon were literally trying to poison us you know he said they may may not have had you know the massive resources that we expect they have you know we expect them to be all powerful and be able to do everything but you know the idea was almost they're a long way from home and they're kind of limited in what they can do but what's particularly interesting is that um when i looked into some early ufo reports here in texas i live just outside dallas um i went to one of the local newspaper archives and when there'd been actually some um, UFO sightings um, in Texas in the early 50s, one of the most famous ones being the so-called Lubbock Lights, as they became known. And so I pulled all the newspaper articles that I could find on the Lubbock Lights. And it turns out that on one of the newspapers that I pulled, um, the story of the Lubbock Lights was on the front page. And literally three columns down, there was information on a sudden outbreak of polio in Texas as well. Um, you know, so that was like a really weird coincidence, but he actually backed up the material in this file from, you know, several years previous in 1949. And um, so, yeah, in other words, when you go looking for trends, you know, and patterns, you can actually find them. But um, that particular one you just requires mentioned a lot is... of digging, but also, you know, a few terrifying. good, helpful coincidences as well. That's terrifying, the one you just mentioned, yeah. to think that we could be subjected to something like that and maybe in the well, future as well. Well, you know, I mean, it is, like I said, it is one of these things where, in sort of typically sci-fi fashion, you know, the Earth gets blasted to pieces by alien spacecraft at the end of the day, you know, the cigar-chomping captain or whoever saves the day, you know. But um, the reality of the situation um, may well be that... um, So if somebody wants to systematically wipe us out from somewhere else... I really don't think in a real world scenario we would stand a chance. You know, it could be all over in a matter of days. Just, you know, just release uh, an alien virus into the Earth's atmosphere that's specifically engineered to act very quickly. You know, I mentioned mm-hmm. sort of rabies earlier with like the zombie virus. You know, I mean, I love stuff like The Walking Dead and Dawn of the Dead and all that kind of stuff. Sure, but too. there's yeah. nothing on our planet in terms of a virus that acts that quickly. 
even rabies, you know, the, the symptoms can actually not appear for, until literally weeks and weeks and weeks after the person's become infected. You know, they have like an initial situation, an initial, initial stage, but, um, and that's the same with a lot of other viruses as well. But I mean, if an alien virus could be engineered to work extremely quickly, you know, within minutes or hours, then, and, you know, we're all human. Each and every one of us on the planet's human. If it's going to take one of us out, it could take all of us out. And, um, you know, we may just have no way to, um, to stop it at all. You know, it's funny you mentioned The Walking Dead because we have them here in Canada. They're all in Ottawa, except most people call them politicians. Folks, Nick Redfern's our guest tonight. His book is called Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind. We're coming up to break in six minutes, so I've just got to do this really quick. I want to thank Kelly Logue. Kelly Logue, folks, as you all know, uh, listeners of the show, puts the website together week after week after week, and he does a magnificent job. He lives up in Juneau, Alaska, and I want to thank you so much, Kelly, for sticking with the show uh, all these years and um, really taking a huge burden off my shoulders, that's for sure. Thank you so much. The other thing I have to do, because my publisher will kill me if I don't do this, I have a new book out, folks. It's called JFK Assassination from the Oval Office to Dealey Plaza. You can get it at www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on that book cover. That'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book, Amazon. Um, it's interviews with witnesses and specialists, including the, the last interview with Ted Sorensen, JFK's friend and speechwriter. We were just talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62, and um, Ted walks us through that. It was he that JFK tasked to write the letter to Khrushchev to get him back to back down. Otherwise, we would not be here right now. How close were we to nuclear war? Well, I spent an afternoon with Ted in his Manhattan apartment. He was a Kennedy speechwriter, as I said, and closest aide. He told me that uh, JFK, during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62, had sent Jackie and the kids, John Jr. and Carolyn, away from Washington. Well, Jackie called him up and uh, could hear in his voice that there was a big problem. And she said, I'm going to bring the kids home tomorrow so we can all die together. That's how close we were. And he said, yes. So uh, no nuclear proof bunker in the White House in those days. Some other stuff, the, it's full of first person witnesses, uh, people who were in Dealey Plaza. And uh, I'm sure our guest tonight, Nick's been down to Dealey Plaza as well, including a crime scene investigator who's used 21st, and she's in Dallas as well, Sherry Feaster. She's used 21st century forensic science because she's a crime scene investigator, put all kinds of people behind bars uh, and examined this Zapruder film, gone down to Dealey Plaza. She has found, scientifically proven now, a frontal shot. You can't argue with science. Um, and that, by definition, means two shooters and conspiracy. So all that information is in this book as well. The first African-American Secret Service agent handpicked by JFK, Abraham Bolden, who was not on duty that day, uh, tells an amazing story of how he protected Carolyn and Jackie. All that's in the book from the Oval Office to Dealey Plaza, uh, JFK assassination, www.nightfrightshow.com. Yay, that's out of the way. I hate doing that, by the way, Nick. <laughs> That's all right. Don't worry about that at all. Oh, that's I, interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, my um, my uh, publisher has asked me to do that uh, at every right. break. Uh, so Nick Redfern's our guest tonight. Folks, when we come back, I'm going to ask him, because we've only got a minute and a half until the music starts. Stick around, by the way, Nick. For, it's only six minutes long. It's good for a, a quick pee break, or what I do is I go for a cup of coffee, too. Mm -hmm. When we come back, I'm going to ask you, because you've done intensive research into the UK and the UFO phenomena there, if there are any names that pop up uh, in terms of any type of communication between the two, the two entities between the West, uh, the Western powers, let's say, if there's some parallels there as well, if they're in communication um, in, in terms of this agency as you say this outsourced agency that all this information is funneling to because i imagine it comes in first to the air forces in both countries and then probably funnels out to 
this agency. Folks, you're listening to Night Fright. I'm Brent Holland, www.nightfrightshow. Stick around for the second half. Nick Redfern is with us. His book is called Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind. And you can get his book as well as uh, all kinds of links to his show, uh, his, um, his website, I should say, at www.nightfrightshow.com. And of course, all the archives are there with all our guests. You can listen to those. Uh, they're all free. You can check out our YouTube channel too. Just go to YouTube and uh, type in Night Fright Show. And you're going to come up with, she's uh, well over, uh, oh, close to 200 um, videos now up there. So it's really going gangbusters. It's going really, really well. And at, yes, I'm stretching for time here because the music hasn't started. <laughs> and I have no control over it. That's the, that's the crazy part. Uh, it should start in a few seconds. Um, so there it is. So we'll be back in six minutes. It's a little rough getting in and out of breaks, let me tell you, because we can't control it. It's all automated. Thank you, Nick. Stick with us for six minutes, my friend. Yeah. And welcome back, folks. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. Get the coffee going, get the tea going, get a beverage of your choice going. Man, have we got a great show going tonight. Nick Redfern's here. We're talking about his new book, Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind. And of course, everybody knows Nick's name. Um, he is no stranger to the UFO conspiracy genre. He's a cryptozoologist as well. And if there's time, we're going to be getting into that as well. Men in Black. Um, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book covers, and that will take you right to a spot where you can order them from the comfort of your own home. Kick back, folks. Put the feet up. It's a great ride tonight. Just before the break, Nick, I um, was going to ask you, you know, I had Paul Hellyer on the show, and Paul Hellyer, folks, as you know, uh, was the ex-Canadian um, uh, in Parliament we have, it's it's not the Secretary of Defense uh, as in the United States. He would be the uh, the military guy, the, the main guy that people would go to. He would be the, the fella. And um, he was claiming that Canada had this top secret airplane called the Arrow in the 50s, and he said he had gone down to Area 51, and he thinks there could be a fully intact Arrow aircraft down there. And I'm just wondering, you know, you've done intensive work, Minister of uh, Defense. Thank you, Brent. I finally got it. You've done intensive work in the UK. You've done intensive work in research also in the United States. Have you come across similar uh, lines of communication, if, if you will? Has has certain names popped up on both sides of the uh, uh, of the Atlantic Ocean? I've never come across anything where both where, where the same names have come across, so to speak. But what I have find, found is that the, the sort of situation in the UK when it comes to UFOs is very much similar to the US. For example, the British Ministry of Defence, which is like the Department of the Defence uh, in the United States, um, has over the years had various UFO programs, but they've largely been, even though they've had some interest in military reports, they've been largely small scale. For example, between 1991 and 1994, the organisation was run by Nick Pope, who's now a well-known figure in the UFO field. But um, even Nick admits that in his three years as the sort of the desk officer that handled the UFO project, he never once left the office to investigate a case. There was never any money for field research or to go and visit the homes of witnesses, nothing. However, in exactly the same time frame that all these projects were going on, sort of in-house limited budget programs, I've got dozens of reports from military personnel who said that the really sensitive UFO cases were handled by a far more deeply buried group somewhere within defense intelligence. Um, and so, in other words, that kind of parallels with what we hear from the U.S. and Canada and other places, that where, yes, there are um, well-known and, and acknowledged programs, like with the U.S. Air Force's Project Blue Book, there are also rumors of much deeper buried programs. And so you have that parallel in the U.K. I'll give you a classic example as well, mm -hmm. and, and it relates to how I got interested in UFOs. My, uh, 
my dad was in the British Royal Air Force. Um, he worked as a, a radar mechanic, and he was involved in several incidents where UFOs were tracked on the screens, and um, everybody was told not to talk about it. <laughs> Planes were sent up. Um, the pilots couldn't get close. The pilots were told not to talk about it. The ground crew, you know, the fuel, the aircraft. Everybody was told they'd signed the Official Secrets Act, and my dad didn't tell me till I was like 13. That's what got me interested. Now, this, th these events occurred across three nights, and um, it was in September 1952 at the height of a NATO exercise called Main Brace. And um, so it occurred over three nights. You had people like my dad who worked on repairing radar and checking it to see if there's any faults. You had the radar operators, you had the pilots and the crews, um, you had the fuel guys on the ground, so that you know dozens of people involved, and everybody's testimony was taken. So clearly, a big file would have been put together, but that file's never been released, and it's not even been acknowledged to exist. But I've spoken to probably now about six or seven of the other people who were involved, and you know they some of them now have obviously passed away. But I mean, they you, you can tell that they're being legitimate. They're all you know some of them didn't even know each other. Some were actually from different bases to the one my dad was stationed at, but they were tracking the movements of the UFOs further up the English coastline, um, but at the same time. So, in other words, we have situations like this, very sensitive events where files should exist. They clearly went somewhere, but they don't seem to have gone to the acknowledged programs that the government admits did exist or do exist, like the one in which Nick Pope worked. So that, that does parallel you know, what's going on elsewhere, too. So definitely, there's a there's a, a cover-up, if you will, going on, and perhaps these files, like you said, are being outsourced to that third-party anonymous, I guess, wherever that may exist. Who knows? Um, the other thing I was going to ask you, in your research, as you approach, you know, you just mentioned a lot of the witnesses are dying off now. Mm -hmm. Do you find that some of them are, are ready to unload? I'll give you a good example. I had mentioned Ted Sorensen before, and JFK speechwriter. When I interviewed him for the last time, it's his last interview, he seemed ready to unload, and he confirmed conspiracy in the JFK assassination. Now you don't have to go buy my book. Great. Now my publisher's really going to be happy. <laughs> not, it was not a coup d'etat. Um, however, he was really ready to unload. I think he felt the end was near. Have you found that in certain cases as well when you speak to some of the people that were on the inside? Yeah, I think a lot of people, as they sort of get older, they take the view, well, what's going to happen if I release it, you know? And I think I think sometimes people who... I mean, it sounds ex filish but I mean, I actually think okay. it's just some people whose lives may be in danger mm. have actually put themselves in a better position by coming forward, because if you're visible in the, and in the public domain... It's unlikely something's going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting on something, but you're planning to release it, somebody knows, but you haven't told anybody yet, then you could be in far more danger. So in that sense, you know, saying, being very visible and public and, you know, doing TV shows and then going public with it all is probably a, a safe way to do it, really. And uh, But, yeah, I mean, it's like with my dad. I mean, you know, if you ask him today, he's 82 now, and he'll tell you what he knows. Um... You know, he didn't sort of expand on it or speculate. Just well, we tracked something, and we weren't flying anything like that back then. The Russians weren't, the Americans weren't, nobody was. Um, and he, this occurred in '52, uh, when he was just in his early twenties, and um, he told me about like probably about '78, '79, when I was just a kid. Um, I was like 12 years old or something like that when he told me, and uh, and that's what got me interested. But so he'd waited, you know. Granted, I was, you know, wasn't born when the event occurred, um, but you know, he did wait, um, you know, a number of years. I think he only told my mother, apart from me. You know, nobody else was let in on it. You know, it's funny because uh, I started this show in Northern Ontario in a place called Sudbury. In Sudbury, there. Are in the old, old days, uh, I wasn't there at the time, um, but the Buffon director was telling me this story from Sudbury, and he was saying that they used to have a NATO base up there. It was part of the Dew Line uh, early tracking system, and very often 
um, they would get something flying over that was unidentifiable and they'd have to launch and go after the darn thing. And by the time they got the airplanes up there, it was gone. Oh, wow. God knows what it was. So I'll get you in touch with him. His name is uh, Michel Deschamps. He's got some oh, fascinating thanks. Canadian stories. So hmm. it might be something you might be interested in. Yeah, sure. Thanks. When I told Kelly Logue, the guy that puts my website together, and thank you again, Kelly, that you were coming on the show, he said, ask him about Men in Black. So here's that question. Now, never mind about Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. We know those guys are real. <laughs> do the men in black really exist? Yeah, they do. Um, mm. The interesting thing about the men in black mystery, you know, everybody, well, I say everybody, a lot of the general public certainly aren't sort of obviously, you know, overly aware of all the intricacies of the UFO subject. Um, you know, they, most people's perception is that the men in black are just a creation of, of Hollywood. Mm. Um but that's actually not the case at all. The movies were based upon a comic book series, and the comic books were inspired by real-life reports that go back to the late 40s. So I've, uh, I've actually written three books on the Men in Black mystery, two of which have been published, and a third one, which um, I'm not sure when it's coming out, but, it, but it's essentially finished anyway. Okay. Um, and it's probably one of my... Well, I say probably. It is. It's one of my sort of favourite subjects to write about, but... Um, the real Men in Black are actually very different from the movie version. You know, in the movies, um, Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones' characters, J and K, mm -hmm. work for this sort of super secret agency. Actually, funnily enough, not unlike what I think the real agency is like, in the, in the sense that the agency they work for isn't actually a part of government. It's like, a, I guess, like a super secret agency that operates outside of government. Mm -hmm. um, but just as an aside, they're called J and K, in the movies because it's like paying homage to John Keel, that's his initials, JK. Because John Keel, who wrote the Mothman Prophecies book, sure. was one of the first people to sort of really highlight big time the Men in Black mystery. I that's where that. they get their name from, J and K. But um, the the real Men in Black are nothing like, you know, they don't look anything like FBI agents or the work for the FBI or the NSA. They're typically sort of five feet tall to five feet five, very pale, white-looking, um, emaciated, um, and they wear these old-style suits and skinny black ties and old-style fedora hats. And they often wear these large black wraparound sunglasses, mm -hmm. and people have said as they've got close to them, they can see these sort of large, bulging eyes, like one witness actually called them like thyroid eyes. And... Um, so this has given rise to the idea that the real men in black are some sort of extraterrestrial entity themselves, almost like a hybrid or something like that. But um, what I find fascinating about the men in black mystery, there's all the different theories and angles, uh, which you wouldn't necessarily imagine. You know, some researchers take the view that they're somehow linked to the UFO phenomenon. They could be, as I said, sort of some sort of hybrid entity those that's almost like programmed to go out and silence people rather than being you know a living entity maybe like a biological almost like a computer program you know that's just built to perform a specific task but i have a lot of record uh, reports on record where people have been visited by the men in black but where there's been no ufo component at all uh for example i've got reports where people have seen bigfoot and they've been visited by the men in black really? i've got seven or eight reports from people who've visit, been visited by the Men in Black when they've been using Ouija boards and the Men in Black would turn up like a day or two after. Oh, and they often good. have these sort of weird paranormal and occult overtones attached to them that sort of take it far away from regular ufology to where many people feel that, you know, the, the Men in Black are just literally like some sort of some sort of definitively evil thing. By mm -hmm. evil, I mean, you know, literally evil. Um, so there's lots of fascinating different aspects to the, UF, the Men in Black mystery. It's not just like the idea that they're, quote, government spies. You know, that, that's ironically, that image that most people have is, is really the one that's furthest away from the truth. Is there any evidence that you've come across or is there any accounts of them actually speaking to people and warning them to not to do things? Oh, yeah. Yeah, really? I mean, wow. because I've written three books on the subject, and yeah. I also do a lot of articles for websites, mm -hmm. you know, updating my research, I, I probably get, I, I would say at least three or four reports a month 
of men in black cases, some of them recent, others where people have just stayed quiet for decades and finally decided to come forward. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of reports, and this about them speaking to witnesses. And this is interesting because in many cases when they speak to them, it's in the witness's own home. Now, you imagine a scenario, you know, say it's 11 o'clock at night, and you hear three slow bangs on your front door. Well, at the very least, what you can do is look through the spy hole, and if you see three creepy little guys in tri black trench, trench coats and fedoras, you probably would not open the door. You might even call the police. You know, you'd probably or, see my ass crawling out the back window yeah. or something. Yeah. Or if you live here in Texas, you know, you go into your bedroom and you pull your gun out. <laughs> Be ready for whatever's about to happen. Um, now, there's but, two things that the UK and Canada have in common. We don't well, have that's guns. True. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah. And, um, but what's interesting is that in most of the men in black cases, the people do open the front door. And... Mm. It's in retrospect, it's like, you know, you know, when a person sort of comes around from anesthetic and they start, they're not the normal cells for like 10 minutes. Sure. You know, they hit, then the anesthetic starts to wear off. Mm -hmm. It's like that. It's like something has taken over the mental faculties of, um, of the person and where they do open the door. And the men in black don't, as you might imagine, barge the way in. They don't force the way in. They stand on the doorstep waiting for the person to physically say the words, would you like to come in? They have to be, they have to be invited in. And that kind of ties in with the old vampire legend. Yeah, I was of, thinking the same You know, thing. a vampire, the first time it enters your home, has to be invited. Not every time, but just the first time. So they invite them in, the man in black sit down, and then the person sits there while the man in black threaten them and, you know, make these veiled allusions to what could happen and all sorts of things. They question them vigorously, and the person just answers the questions. And very often the person feels sort of weak and sick, as if they've been drained of energy almost. And that's also one of the interesting theories, that these could be like, almost like, um, Psychic like a predatory, um, parasitic creature. And then like another vampire parallel, you know, in the legends, vampires suck us uh, dry of blood. Mm -hmm. The men in black seem to drain us of energy, like a diabetic crashing or something like that. Um, and in, so, yeah, in, in these cases, there's a lot of conversation goes on, but it tends to be very much one-sided, where the witness just sits there, and the man in black makes the threats. Then they all sort of stand up. There's generally three of them. They sort of shuffle out the room in this weird fashion, and they're gone. And then it's over the next sort of four or five minutes or so, the person starts to come out of this sort of, not complete haze, but almost like a slightly, like a, almost like a slightly drunken stupor or something like that. And, um, and the men in black had gone. But uh, so a lot of very weird aspects like that. So, uh, so in other words, guns don't do much good at all <laughs> you know, with the men in black. But I mean, totally off topic, you know, I, I actually think if, if you can live in a society that actually doesn't allow the general public to have guns, then it is better. Because the problem is, of course, when a country has guns and has had them for so long, then it becomes difficult to say, well, you're not allowed to have them because the criminals have all got them. So, but I do think if you can, you know, my personal view is if you can limit from the word go, you know, who has access to a gun, overall it is better in the long term for everybody. I agree. Yeah, you won't get an argument out of me. Um, yeah, it's, yeah um, absolutely. I think, and I uh, think, you know, one of the most dangerous things about guns is when they become glorified, you know, mm. that's the problem. You know, people are going to have the biggest, the baddest, you know, looking thing. You know, I mean, I've done target practice. I enjoy it. But, you know, I don't, I don't feel that a gun should be glorified. Um, and But the problem is, of course, you know, the staple part of society in you know, so many countries that that's why people make the argument, well, I need one because the criminals have got one. And that's the big problem, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, uh, Jesse Ventura said that, and he's been on the show, folks. He, we didn't discuss this on the show, but he's on record as saying he believes every American should carry a gun and there'd be a lot less crime. I don't agree with him. I think that would just well, be a Well, you know, I mean, I've heard these stories about, you know, they're sort of making gun laws... Uh, more lax to where you can take them in restaurants and whatever. And somebody made the point, oh, yeah, that, you know, on a Friday night, everybody's drinking. Yeah, that's not going to end up in disaster. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to end well. And could you imagine taking your kid to a movie, a Disney movie or something? 
and mm. there's parents there sitting with handguns? No, I actually couldn't imagine it, but, um, you know, that's, that's why I think, you know, it's kind of like anything. You put dangerous tools into people's hands, and if they're not, you know, sort of respectful of it and aware of it and everything else, you know, it can just end in, end in disaster. It's just going to um, be a bloodbath, I think. Yeah, so I think, I think, I think there should always, I think there should be, you know, major debate on, on gun control. Um, but as I said the, the big problem is, you know, it's 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 the fact that when when the criminals, you know, hundreds of thousands are armed to the teeth, then I can understand why people have concerns and worries. You know, it's like if I have, you know, the laws change not to give my gun up or whatever, mm -hmm. the criminals aren't exactly going to do the same, you know. So I, I do understand both sides of the arguments, but I think if you can start off a country or, or a culture without them, it's better. But trying to withdraw them, you know, it's kind of like when the horse is bolted out the gate, that, how do you get it back in? That's the problem. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Let's stay in Texas, shall we? Uh, and let's stay with some fatalities as well. Can you tell us the story about uh, the UFO confrontation that happened in Texas, December 1980? Oh, yeah, this is a, a very interesting case yeah. that occurred in the final days of 1980, specifically uh, December the 28th. And it involved um, three people, a woman named uh, Betty Cash, a friend of hers, Vicky Landrum, and Vicky's grandson, Colby. Uh, so this December 1980, and uh, they were heading home uh, near the town of Huffman in Texas. Um, as I said, I live in Texas, just outside, like a 20-minute drive from the, from Daly Plaza, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, the, you know, everybody thinks of Texas. They think of desert and cactus. And yeah, I don't you know, know why. Actually, Texas is nothing like that. That's no, sort of more... New Mexico and Arizona. Now, West Texas is very flat, but you get to Dallas, I'm sure as you know, when you came, you came in, there's actually quite a lot of woodland. Now, you head sort of 45 minutes east out of um, Dallas, you're in heavy forest because you're bordering towards Louisiana. That's right. You've know, got the swamps and the forest there. So it's very, East Texas is sort of heavily wooded and forested all the way down to sort of Houston. And this sort of gets to the part of the story because um, Hoffman, where the family were, fl were driving to and the friends were driving to, is sort of like an isolated, heavily wooded area, even though it's not that long a drive outside of the city of Houston, like about 45 minutes or thereabouts. But what happened was that the three, the two women and the young boy, they're in the car and they're driving along this sort of country-type road when they saw this light in the sky that seemed to be... They couldn't work out what it was. It didn't seem to be an aircraft. It didn't have the sort of regular green, red, and white lights that you see on an airplane. And um, they watched it, and they watched it, and they could not figure out what it was at all. Um, and it seemed to get lower and lower to the point where they actually stopped the car. And by this time, as it got even lower, they could see it was like a vertical, diamond-shaped object glowing brilliantly. Um, and they could feel the car heating up. They got out the car, and Betty Cash got closest to it, and um, you know the heat was intense. Reportedly, when they got back in the car, they had to uh, like put their clothes, like a, pull the jacket over to actually get the car door open. It was so hot, and obviously backed away from the area. Now, as they did so, they said like a squadron, a huge squadron of double rotor um, helicopters came into view. Um, in excess of 20 of them. And they were described as military helicopters, or perceived to be, like Chinooks, the, the double rotor ones that you mm -hmm. see around. And um, the the inference was that they were either trying to capture it, if it was a UFO, or if it was some sort of classified military device that had gone out of control and off range or something. They were sort of trying to shepherd it in, or if it crashed, you know, seal the area off for recovery. You know, lots of different theories as to what the UFO was. You know, was it one of ours or was it one of, quote, theirs? We still really don't know. But what was sort of most concerning for the, the two women and the, and the boy was that the next day, both of them fell, excuse me, all three of them fell very sick. Nausea, dizziness, sickness, etc., etc. Now, Betty Cash, who got closest to the craft, 
experienced the worst symptoms. I mean, literally in days, she suffered major hair loss, just like chunks of hair falling out. Radiation um, disease. Yeah, uh, it mm. kind of sounds like it's, it kind of sounds like radiation um, poisoning. The only thing is that you know radiation poisoning to the extent where it makes your hair fall out and you're throwing up and you're really sick, generally indicates a lethal dosage. And if that was the case, you know she shouldn't have recovered, but she did. Now, granted, she did actually die 18 years later of breast cancer. Even really enough, it was actually 18, day, 18 years later to the very day. It was exactly wow. the same day, December the 28th. But, um, you know, generally with radiation poisoning, as I said, if, if, you go, if you get those symptoms, that's because you've got a lethal dose. Um, other theories have been put forward that maybe it was some sort of chemical agent that they were exposed to. The, some chemical agents actually do mimic the symptoms of radiation poisoning, but you know, you, you, it's not like a lethal dose to where you're not at the point of no return. So that's a possibility. Um, so we don't really know. But, I mean, the case itself has been covered extensively. Uh, John Schuessler used to work for NASA, actually at the Houston Space Center. I said not, only like 45 minutes from where this occurred. He wrote a full-length book on this, and it's probably one that somebody one day really ought to write another book on it because... You know, it sort of lends itself to further investigation, and um, it, and it is a fascinating story. But um, you know, nobody owned up to owning this sort of 23 plus helicopters that were reportedly seen. And despite the fact that Betty Cash tried to bring a suit um, against the government, um, you know, in terms of damages and and sort of monetary um, compensation. That was thrown out, and um, for all intents and purposes, the event was dismissed. Um, so we don't really know the truth of it. As I said, was it one of ours? Was it one of theirs? We don't know. But, I mean, it, for me at least, it's, it's, a, it's a highly credible case. Um, and, you know, what, what's interesting as well, it's a time frame. Dece December the 28th, that was actually the last night of when you had the, the Rendlesham Forest incidents going on in England. Yes. Um, you know, at a military base involving military personnel. Sure. So, uh, on the other side of the world, but the exact same time frame. That's incredible. I never connected the two. Good work there, Nick. Nick Redfern, folks, is our guest tonight. Triple W dot Night Fright Show. There, you will find a book cover that says "Close Encounters." of the fatal kind and that's exactly what we're discussing tonight his research on his new book just click on that book cover that's going to take you right to a spot where you can order it from the comfort of your own home triple w one thing i would just yes, say please, uh, when i made mention the cash landrum case and somebody should do a book on it i should stress that wasn't an allusion to me to because <laughs> you know I, but i think i really do think somebody should you know i'm not going to do it but because you know, I've got enough on my plate already with writing, but I do think somebody should because, you know, John Schuessler's book's a good one, but it is time for an update, and I think if somebody really dug deep, spent time out there, got onto the trail of it, you know, we, we would see a major story developing again. Anybody out there, folks, the gauntlet's been thrown down, yeah. so please do pick it up and run with it because I agree with Nick. I think uh, there's more research needed, and... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely, without question. You know, one of the things that uh, that's in the book, uh, Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind, that was disturbing, was the story about uh, the deaths of a bunch of dozens of scientists in the mid 1980s. Mm. Um, what's the link between UFOs and all these guys dying? Well, yeah, all these uh, people, which range from scientists to computer programmers to analysts, um, you know, across the weapons experts. Um, all of them worked, either worked for or were subcontracted to a company called Marconi. And Marconi was and still is, it's now been incorporated into another company. But for years, when it was its standalone company, it did a huge amount of work for the British Ministry of Defence, the British uh, Royal Air Force, the Royal Navy, and the British Army. And much of it related to things like sophisticated weapon systems, um, undersea technologies for submarines, mm -hmm. laser-guided systems, laser weapons, radar, all sorts of things. Now, back in the early 1980s, President Reagan 
came forward with this idea, this vision he had for what became known as Star Wars. It was the, actually called the Strategic Defence Initiative, or That's SDI. Right. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to have sort of this orbiting armada of laser-based weapons that in the event that the Soviets or the Chinese or whoever launched a sneak attack, essentially the missiles could be evaporated for all intents and purposes before they'd barely got out of the silos. So in other words, it wouldn't stop the missiles being launched, but if you had this sort of huge fleet of laser-based weapons, you could just hopefully knock them all out one at a time and perhaps barely one or two would actually get through. Um, now, although it was sort of a grand and enthusiastic plan, you know, it, I think with hindsight, it's clear that the technology wasn't as advanced as it was hoped to be. Um, and even with a great deal of digging and research, it still didn't really come to fruition, you know, in the way that Reagan wanted it to. But what's interesting is that um, there have been rumours that SDI, while it legitimately would have targeted the Soviets and it would have targeted the Chinese, um, there was also rumours that Reagan had been told something by officials, I guess, you know, in the high-up people, that there was a looming alien threat or there was a potential alien threat. And so part of Reagan's scenario was that the SDI could be pointed outwards as well as inwards you know, to combat a lethal alien civilization that might be coming our way. Now, although that sounds, you know, a little bit sensational, it is a fact that in the same time frame that he was championing um, SDI, Reagan was also giving lectures, like at the UN and schools and different places, where he would say to the audience, you know, just imagine if aliens invaded or attacked, it would we would be forced to all to join together as, you know, one species rather than individual nations and, you know, be a human race rather than this country or that country. And Reagan said this on a number of occasions, almost as if he was trying to subtly get the word out. So the time frame in that is interesting. But what's more interesting is that Marconi, many of their leading personnel were um, contracted to do research on, on SDI. And they actually became known as the Star Wars scientists. That's sort of the extent to which they're involved. But literally between 1982 and 1991, no less than 31 people either working for or subcontracted to um, Mark Oney on these weapon systems, laser devices, um, radar technologies, all that would have played a role, obviously, in SDI, died under very weird circumstances. Um, we had things like sudden car accidents. Somebody's driving down the highway and they just veered off into oncoming traffic. Um, and bear in mind that these were all people who you know, weren't displaying any evidence of stress or depression. There were others who just you know, parked their car, got home from work, put the car in the garage and um, started up the engine and you know, put a hose pipe in the exhaust and, and killed themselves. Um, others killed themselves in really weird fashion. There was one guy, for example, who drove his car to a nearby lamppost, got out the car, tied a rope around the lamppost, got back in the car, put the other end around his neck and hit the accelerator and decapitated himself. Oh um, there were others who electrocuted themselves in really weird fashions. Um, there were people who jumped off bridges. Um, Others just vanished. Now, one of the really interesting ones was a guy who actually didn't die, but he vanished only to um, resurface about three months later in, of all places, Paris, France. And uh, this was sort of really strange because nobody could, um, nobody could really kind of figure figure out why on earth that should be the play, why that on earth that should be the case and he could not not only could he not account for what had happened during that period but it was almost as if his mind had been played with you know to the extent that perhaps as some people believe he may have suffered from some sort of um like a subliminal programming so if somebody wanted him gone you know suddenly that kicks in and the person either commit them, you know, commit suicide, uh, jumps off a bridge, you know, electrocutes themselves, whatever. And um, and that that was like a very odd story. This was a man, his name was Adbar, uh, Avtar Singh Gida. And um, he actually worked on classified programs 
for the British Ministry of Defence with direct ties uh, to Marconi. And it was actually in January '87 when he vanished. And I mean, there was a major police hunt purely because there'd been these other Marconi deaths. And um, as I said, he, a lot of these cases, what's particularly interesting, but also disturbing, is that when the people committed suicide, it actually wasn't the first time that some of them had, had done it or tried to do it. You know, they obviously succeeded the second time. But there was some where there was one guy where he had a really weird car accident and he said he felt com something had like taken control of his mind mm. and he felt compelled to cross across the uh, three-way highway into the oncoming traffic at like 70 miles an hour. And he had to fight to break away from that urge. But then he was one of the guys who turned up like weeks later dead in his garage from carbon monoxide poisoning. So in other words, he cheated death the first time but not the second. So this has given sort of deep rise to the idea that some sort of maybe subliminal programming or hypnosis or mind control was used. Now, the most intriguing but of course controversial theory is that if Star Wars, SDI, was targeted against hostile extraterrestrials, and the technology had to be developed. Well, if you were the extraterrestrials, how would you prevent the technology being developed? Precisely. Maybe you would target, mind control-wise, the very people who would be working on the program, which would be the scientists, which would be the technicians, the computer programmers. Maybe you would get your grips into their minds. You would sort of subtly manipulate them and control them to kill themselves. Now, whether or not that's true, the fact is we have... You know, the stories of the SDI links to the UFO phenomenon. We have the SDI scientists working, um, Marconi scientists, excuse me, working on the SDI program. And then we have literally 31 of these people dead. So, you know, I actually do give some serious thought to the, the idea that the intelligence is behind the UFO phenomenon itself. We're actually wiping these people out. Jeez, that's, that's terrifying. That's chilling. You know, it reminds me, I'm going to reference the Kennedy assassination again. All these witnesses were being killed off as well and yeah. were threatened. Um, yeah. It's absolutely... Well, one thing I would please, say please. is that, you know, I've done a chapter on that in the book, and you can find a few things online, but there actually was a book, an entire full-length book written about the Marconi scientist death, and it's really hard to get now because it only had one printing in the UK, and it was never reprinted, but it was written by a guy named Tony Collins, and it's called Open Verdict, and that is like a really good in-depth study of, of all the Marconi scientist deaths, and you can be, I don't think you have any problem getting a spare copy or a used copy, but um, you won't find it sort of brand new on any bookshelves anyway. The book we are talking about tonight, folks, is called Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind, and its author and our guest tonight is Nick Redfern. Easy way to get his book and all his books and links to his sites as well, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book cover and order the book. It's fabulous, as all Nick Redfern's books are, and he's a legend in the industry without question. Um, another story that was really unnerving because this one just happened. Well, for me, it just happened. 1999, Jim Keith, he's a UFO uh, author. What happened to Jim? Well, the Jim Keith story is a very weird one, and it kind of almost borders on, like, the supernatural. Um, Jim Keith was not just a UFO researcher. He's probably more like a conspiracy research. You know, I, I tend to write about UFOs and government files and also cryptozoology, the Bigfoot, you know, which is my other big interest, cryptozoology, strange creatures. But Jim Keith was somebody who really delved into not just UFOs, but political conspiracies as well. Everything from uh, the death of Princess Diana um, to sort of big business-related issues and, you know, government-sponsored assassinations, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, what happened was that in uh, 1999, uh, Jim Keith visited the Nevada-based Burning Man Festival, which, funnily enough, takes its name from the old court, the so-called old Wicker Man um, sacrifices in Celtic times, in, like, in England and Scotland, mm -hmm. um, where like this huge wooden effigy of a man would be burned as a sort of a pe and they it would be loaded with sort of goats and chickens and things like this, and they would be sacrificed to appease 
sort of the nature gods, you know, to en- ensure like a bountiful harvest, you know, in the next season and so on. And there's actually a very good uh, movie made about this called The Wicker Man, starring Edward Woodward, made in, I think, 72 or 73. But avoid the uh, the Nicolas Cage remake, which is horrible. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the, um, the story of The Wicker Man was what basically inspired Burning Man, where people would go along and this huge effigy would be burned, and it still is every year to this day, you know, and it would be like a cleansing process who, you know, you had a failed relationship or you lost your job, you know, it'd be a way of sort of starting fresh and so on. Uh, So Jim Keith went along, and bear in mind that, you know, that the whole scenario revolves around human sacrifice. Well, Jim Keith actually fell off the stage and fractured his tibia, his shin bone, um, at the conference, or the events, and uh, went home, but the next morning he's, he was just in such terrible pain, he had to call an ambulance. They took him to the nearest medical center, hospital, and um, they uh, x-rayed his leg and said, yep, yeah, you know, you fractured the tibia, we're gonna have to fix it, we're gonna have to knock you out. And it turns out that Jim Keith's uh, nephew came to hospital, and Jim Keith said two things were worrying him. One was that apparently he'd run into somebody in the hospital who he'd had a debate on black helicopters with, who he felt had some sort of ties to, like, the black ops world. Mm. And there was somebody in the hospital with that name. That worried him. And he actually said to his nephew, if they put me under the, the knife, or, excuse me, if they put me under the gas, you know, knock me out, I'm not going to wake up. And incredibly, that's exactly what happened. He oh, did yeah. not wake up. Um, now, what he died from, and there's no doubt from what he died from, he actually died from a blood clot in his lung, a massive blood clot in one of his lungs. Now, the official story is that uh, the blood clot sort of formed in his leg when the leg was broken and then travelled through his bloodstream to his lungs and then, you know, just hit the lungs and stopped his heart stone dead. Um, but what's really weird is that in the uh, months uh, leading up to his death, Jim Keith had actually been... Uh, researching very deeply like a new form of bioweapon which a person could be injected with a particular like a, a substance which would cause the blood to clot massively and specifically in the lungs in other words it would make it look like a person had just you know had a bad just a, just their bad fortune you know they developed a blood clot and it killed them like sometimes it happens when people are on a plane for a mm-hmm. long time uh, so he'd been writing about that now in the day, just literally days before he died, um, Jim Keith had been corresponding on email with a friend of mine, Greg Bishop, who lives in Los Angeles and who's a uh, well-respected author in the UFO subjects and other fields. Both Greg and Jim had had weird computer hacks at around about the time that Jim died, uh, just before, I should say. And um, files had been deleted, and it was as if they were being watched. So that that was like an ominous precursor. But what happened after that was even weirder. Um, was that Ron Bonds, who was Jim Keith's publisher, he died, um, and that was reportedly uh, put down to a specific type of food poisoning, Clostridium, uh, caused by Clostridium. Now it turns out that. Um, Jim Keith had been, when he'd been researching cattle mutilation cases, mm-hmm. he found that all the cases he'd looked into, the cows had a, an excess amount of clostridium in their system. So that was kind of really weird as well. On top of that, when um, Jim Keith died, he was actually working on an update to a book called The Octopus, which he wrote with Ken Thomas. Ken Thomas, the book itself, dealt with sort of one of these sort of shadow type super secret agencies known as the Octopus. Um, And the book itself dealt with a man named Danny Casolaro, a journalist, who in 1991 was also going to be writing a book about the Octopus, and he was found dead in a hotel room with his wrist slashed. So, in other words, you had Danny Casolaro dead, who was going to be the subject, who was the subject of the first edition of uh, the Jim Keith, Ken Thomas book. Then you have Jim Keith himself dying, then you have his publisher dying, and you have Jim Keith dying according to, you know, circumstances mm-hmm. that he'd written about, um, blood clots in the lungs. Then you had Ron Bonds dying of the very bacteria that um, Keith noted was extremely prevalent 
in cases of mutilated cattle. So, you know, there are all these weird strands, and this actually gave rise to an interesting theory, which ties in, of all things, with the death of Princess Diana, um, Keith, which Keith was also looking at into the time of, of his death, the idea that she was pregnant and, you know, she was going to marry uh, Dodie Fayed and so on. And um, it gave rise to the theory that what if somebody had literally managed to sort of weaponize the world of the occult and sort of weaponize curses and you know where you could literally dispatch a curse to someone so in that sense jim keith's would literally his fell his fall off the stage would have been a fall in the same way that ron bonds would have been through food poisoning and diana would have been a car accident but the scenario that some researchers have suggested is it was sort of like a a directed curse you know literally putting curses on someone to to ensure bad luck you know sort of have like a black cloud hanging over them so the inevitable end is on the horizon it's sort of like the best way to describe it, like a psychic assassination or an occult assassination you know and i come back to the fact that of all the places it could have happened to jim keith was at a festival dedicated to human sacrifice you know maybe the circumstances and the place have to be right to allow for something like that to happen i think it also ties in with what you said before about the fellow that was driving along and felt this mm. urge a voice in his head if you will for lack of a better way of putting it to have him swerve yep. over into the opposite lane that's terrifying stuff <laughs> Folks, Nick Redfern's well, our guest. A lot of, lot of research has been done. Uh, I mean, the CIA had a program in the late 60s, 60s called Operation Often, which was literally looking at the, the idea of using the world of the occult and black magic from, um, from the perspective of, like, national security, in the same way that the 70s, when the CIA set up its remote viewing program mm -hmm. to psychically spy, you know, on the KGB or whoever. Uh, Operation Often was doing something similar but actually trying to create, use the power of the mind and the occult to to essentially project fatal illnesses into foreign world leaders and things like that. So it's a very, very strange program. Wow. That is, that's really weird. Now, have you ever been threatened or anything? Overtly? Covertly? No, I haven't. But I, I talk about this in the book because one of the things I've found with all the deaths, you know, where, even when they're totally separated and unconnected there is actually one thing that runs through most of them not all but most of them mm -hmm. and that is where the person whether it's a member of the public somebody in the ufo community the military or you know politician where somebody seems to be on the verge of really revealing something or releasing something that could really sort of blow the whole door down and you know knock the entire stack of cards down now you know me, I interview a lot of people, I use the Freedom of Information Act, things like this, but, you know, I don't have any kind of smoking gun that could, you know, bring down the walls of UFO secrecy. So, like most people in ufology, you know, uh, I write about what I can, but the big, you know, that locked door still remains locked. You know, I don't know what's behind it. Right. But there are numerous cases, which I talk about in the book, where, like Forrestal, um, maybe like Kennedy, various other people that if somebody who you know is part of this group that's hiding the truth feels that someone is on the verge of revealing something and it is something legitimate it seems to be the case that, that those are the people have, have the main uh, main thing to to worry about you know there have been thousands of people in ufology over the last 70 years authors researchers article writers radio hosts you know tv hosts you name it and nothing's happened to them but that's because they're all like me and you. They're very interested. They've done research and studies, but they haven't got that smoking gun. But it's the people who may have that that I think are the ones who get in trouble. Um, and I think the rest of us, there's probably some sort of cursory file put together. But I think, you know, it's, it doesn't go much beyond that. Because if it did, we would clearly know if everybody in the subject was dropping like flies, which they're not. So, uh, okay. you know, it, it is sort of like an elite group elite from an unfortunate perspective and unfortunately but uh, but it is like an elite group that seem to be the ones who wow you know somebody's got something and somebody else says okay they've got to go you know mm -hmm. before they can get it out 
Well, stay safe, my stay safe, my friend. Um, you had mentioned Bigfoot before, and your interest in in Bigfoot. Um, through this show and, and another show I do called the Brent Holland Show, I've had wonderful, wonderful guests and people to speak with and interview. One of those people was Jane Goodall. Oh yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you probably know this already, yeah. but she believes in Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just wondering. You know, what's your take on Bigfoot? Is there seems to be a general a general consensus that there is such a creature? Uh, I mean, coming from an authority as as reputable as Jane Goodall, I mean, you know, if if that doesn't tell you that there's something there, what else would? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind at all that there's a genuine Bigfoot phenomenon. I mean, and it's not just in the U.S. You know, it just happens to be called Bigfoot in the U.S. or Sasquatch. I mean, in Russia, they have their own equivalent known as the Almasty. Um, in China, you have the Yeren. Australia has the Yowie. You go back five or 600 years across Europe, you had what were known as wild men. They're all over the place, or they were. Um, but what fascinates me about the Bigfoot mystery is there are a lot of cases that we might term rogue cases where people have actually seen Bigfoot in the same proximity and time frame as UFOs. There are other reports of these creatures sort of like winking out in a flash of light or just fading away hmm. uh, or being impervious to bullets and um, even shape-shifting into other forms of creatures. Um, and although I believe there's a genuine phenomenon, I think Bigfoot is far weirder than just being like a North American unacknowledged or unclassified primate. You know, I think that uh, I think there's something more weird and sort of supernatural about Bigfoot. You know, I don't pretend to understand or define really what the term supernatural means, but there are a lot of very strange rogue cases that a lot of people in cryptozoology, which is the study of unknown animals like yes. the Loch Ness Monster, the Chupacabra, Bigfoot, whatever, a lot of researchers won't touch these cases because I think they're just too over the top and they prefer to stick with a regular angle of it's just an unknown ape living in America that science hasn't found. And that, I'm not saying that's impossible, but to deny the weirder percentage of cases, you've probably got to deny like five, six, seven, eight percent of all reports. Um, and, you know, the witnesses, as far as I see it, are the most important people in the subject because without the witnesses, we have nothing to go on. That's right. Now, when they, when you have sort of six, seven, eight percent, whatever, of people saying, hey, yeah, I saw Bigfoot, but A, B, or C happened, then to sort of just file those reports away in a cupboard or whatever, it's very stupid. He's like, a, you know, an ostrich with its head in the sand. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by the weirder side of cryptozoology rather than let just the you, idea that... Yeah, let on. me ask you this then. Do you feel it's terrestrial or extraterrestrial? Um, well, I actually saw, I, I don't think it's extraterrestrial as such. Okay. Uh, when I say it's been seen in conjunction with UFOs, they're more like sort of balls of light and so-called ghost lights. Hmm. One of the things that does fascinate me is the idea of so-called portals or gateways to other realms of, our, of existence. Now, things today like quantum physics are allowing for the existence of multi-dimensions. And with Bigfoot and a lot of these weird crypto creatures, they seem to have this aspect where, you know, sort of classic here one minute, gone the next minute. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like a wave occurs and then yeah, it suddenly comes to a complete end and it pops up again six months later somewhere else. And I sometimes wonder if the reason these things are so successfully elusive 100% of the time is because they're only sort of temporarily in our reality. You know, well, however they define what their other reality is, I think that's when they're there. You know, so in other words, I think they're they inhabit the planet, but not all the time, you know. And that, of course, gets into a lot of controversial areas. When I bring it up at conferences, a lot of regular cryptozoologists just sort of roll their eyes. But, I mean, I mean, I don't care. You know, I don't care what people Good for you. Good for you. Nor <laughs> should you. I've got my views out. I've got my views. I've got my theories. There's witnesses. If people just have an emotional response that they don't like it, well, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. So. Precisely, and that's the way I feel too. That's why I do this show because there's something there, folks. I don't know what it is. Yeah. We're going to have to start to wrap up because there's the music. Nick Redfern has been our guest. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show, Nick. www.nightfrightshow.com. The book is called Close Encounters. Right. Thanks a lot, Brent.
Thank you very much.